Rick Hansen for the Foundations of Well-Being, here focusing on the intimacy pillar of well-being and its first section or theme, me and we. You know, in psychology, it's understood that there are definitely two great themes in human life, in our own psychology. There's probably more to us than this, but a lot falls under these two headings of autonomy on the one hand and intimacy on the other. And this includes the territory of the individual contrasted with the community, or mine contrasted with ours, or differences between me and you, or me and the world out there, or parts of me and parts of you, and similarities. Also, if you think about it, this is the balance of independence or dependence, and of course, distance or closeness right? In interactions even, there's this constant regulation of dis of closeness, you know, getting closer, 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 or whoa, that's a little weird, got to back up, right? People are getting too in your own face. You know, you need to create some distance to be comfortable again with other people. Yeah. And also we have this distinction between detachment, you know, a detached, uh, often analytic, uh, sometimes kind of hyper-rational bird's eye view, contrasted with joining, and someone who's, let's say, interdirected, very uh, referencing of their own internal values and needs and priorities and views, compared with someone who, at least in the moment and maybe more generally, is more other-directed, more guided by and uh, referencing of uh, externalities like uh, social conformity or the standards of the group or what would seem socially desirable. Fundamentally here, in terms of autonomy and intimacy as a kind of shorthand, I'm going to be exploring me and we. Right? So with this as sort of a conceptual framework, thinking about autonomy and intimacy, um, it's important to emphasize that both of these are needed for a healthy, happy, productive life. And they work together, you know. On the one hand, being autonomous actually helps us sustain connection. Because if we feel flooded by others or overrun by them or dominated by them, you know, we need to back away or it's really hard to feel safe enough to become deeply intimate with other people. As the saying has it, fences make for good neighbors. And then on the other side of it, repeated experiences of intimacy help us build resources inside that shore us up as individuals, make us help us feel like a good person and confident of being able to get our needs met with others and have others support us in pursuing our own aims in life. And last, I'd like to point out, there's a natural variation in how important autonomy or intimacy are to a particular individual. Then, of course, there are challenges to autonomy, you know, if we're not able to be um, autonomous, uh, it's really hard to be intimate, you know? So think about it. Are you able to stay uh, centered in yourself with a strong sense of autonomy when other people want things from you? Or maybe they're upset with you? Or what about if they are trying to persuade you, sell you a car, sell you on letting them, you know, stay out past their curfew if there's some, let's say, a kid you have, or even they're trying to manipulate you? How about if they're critical? You know, can you stay centered in your own sense of how big a deal it really was and whether it's a moral fault or simply something to be um, more skillful with in the future? Or even, frankly, there's actually no basis for criticism whatsoever. It's just a collision of preferences that the other person is trying to moralize into some sort of, you know, guilt-inducing critique of you. Hmm. Can you hold on to your inner truth when criticism is coming at you? How about when people don't respect your boundaries, they get invasive, you know, they get too close, or they touch you and you don't want to be touched, or they take what's yours without asking first. Um, what do you do then? Can you feel that you're still entitled to your own sense of individuality? What about when people flat out try to dominate or control you? you know, what happens then? This is the territory that I'm exploring here. You know, it's easy to be autonomous when you're off by yourself, right? But how about when you're in the middle of the mud with other people and it's not working so well, right? Can you sustain a sense of autonomy there without tipping into the red zone and, you know, breaking off all contact with other people or going to war with them? That's what we're gonna be exploring here. So, 
let's talk about how to work the plan, right? How to stay me in the middle of we. Think about your own childhood, right? Uh, if your autonomy and individuality got undermined in childhood, as adults, adults tend to tilt toward one extreme or another of conformity on the one hand or rebelliousness on the other. I became superficially conforming uh, to get off the radar of the authority figures and internally deeply rebellious and independent. Right? What happened to you? Um, these attitudes, by the way, that others have toward us get applied toward ourselves. In other words, when there are longings or yearnings or vulnerable feelings inside you, how do you respond to them? Do you orient to them in a supportive, encouraging, guiding way? What I've called self-guidance, distinct from self-criticism in previous uh, themes in the Foundations program. Or on the other hand, do you shame those desires or dismiss them or tune them out? You know, uh, they don't even exist. Kids don't even have ones, right? Uh, how do you relate to yourself? That's a really interesting exploration as well. And also in terms of childhood, think about different things in terms of their effect today. How comfortable are you uh, really expressing in an open, accessible, claiming it as your own truth, not a universal truth, but your own truth, your own thoughts and feelings or uh, deepest desires? How comfortable are you? How comfortable are you also for asking overtly, not euphemistically, but unmistakably clearly for really what you want and not using proxies to ask for what you want? You know, not, for example, asking for the salt when what you'd really like is for your partner to uh, invest more of his or her energy into cooking a meal for the whole family, right? Also consider can you trust your own judgment, you know, relying on your own view if others disagree with you? Obviously, being open to input and, you know, recognizing your own kind of blind spots. But that said, even if other people, if other people think the sky is green, are you willing, uh, at least inside your own mind, to know that, no, actually, it's blue, right? And if need be, can you stand up to others? Can you express autonomy face to face? in a confrontation if need be, you know, to stand up for yourself or for other people. Can you do these things? What's going on in this area? A bit of a self-assessment. Right? And then let's talk about how to reclaim me in the larger context of we. What are some things that really work here? Well, one is to really come into your own body. Mindfulness of your body is really useful here. My body's here. This breathing. Ah. You know, suddenly then your experience is full of sensations that unmistakably are your own. That's a great way to start coming back into me, tuning back into your own body. Maybe not your breathing, but some other body sensations, you know, including the sense of your feet firmly planted on the floor, coming back into me. Another way to do it is to recognize that there are differences all around you. All kinds of people are different from each other. That's okay. You know, realize, well, differences are not dangerous. We can acknowledge them openly. It's okay. Right? And if you can, include and accept all of yourself. You know, it's hard to be autonomous with other people when you are disowning major parts of yourself. But if you claim your whole self, including the parts that are sad or hurt or kind of creepy or nasty, doesn't mean you act on them, but you claim them. Doing that will help you be more of a me in relationships with other people. Another thing to do in terms of being me in a center, in a sense of we, is to imagine boundaries. I hear Captain Kirk's voice in the back of my head sometimes, shields up, Scotty. Uh, I imagine thick walls of glass sometimes between me and other people, uh, or a picket fence, or at least a line on the ground, or that I'm looking at them through the wrong end of a telescope, they're far away. Uh, different kinds of boundaries. Um, you might just repeat inside your own mind. You can say things inside your own mind. That's kind of an expression of boundaries. I don't agree with you. Or in my one of mine favorites, I'm not implicated in your mind stream. That doesn't mean that I shame your mind stream or I'm against it or hostile to it. But I recognize that, wow, the causes that are producing those thoughts and feelings and views in you are your own. That river of causes is over there. 
the river of causes leading to me is over here, right? Or internally, I'll think to myself, you know, I don't have to agree with you. I may, frankly, need to look like I'm agreeing with you because it would be dangerous not to for some reason. But inside my own mind, I know what I really think. And to remind yourself as well, you know, I can, I can pursue my own aims. I may need to be skillful and cautious about it in this environment that's not safe right now, but I can still pursue my own aims. All right? And then last, when other people support your autonomy, you know, when they back your play, or they're okay if you disagree or see it differently from them, or have different preferences, or, you know, uh, have things that for you are self-evident uh, and a top priority that for M would be the last thing in the world they could ever imagine thinking or wanting. But still, they're okay with that. They're on your side about it, or at least, you know, they're okay with it. When this happens, again and again and again, see if you can really take that in. And through repeated experiences of exploring, you know, really establishing your firm base over here, a secure base over here, to borrow a point from attachment theory, as you establish that secure base in here, you're going to be more and more able to explore and go out into the wonderful wide world of relationships out there.